Hi, my name is Londe Yusuf. And my name is Reggie Williams. And we're the co-founders of Black Film Space. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. We host events such as screenwriting workshops, panels, mixers, and other events that are designed to support black content creators. In the next episode of the Black Film Space podcast, we interview Rochelle Moseley Wood, a lecturer in film studies and literature at the University of West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. Rochelle recently published the book, Show Us As We Are, Place, Nation, and Identity in Jamaican Film. And more recently, she has been researching colonial film in the British West Indies and charting the film culture of the 1950s. We talk with Rochelle about the significance of cinema in the 1950s Caribbean in regards to nation formation, the origins of the Jamaican film unit, how films were distributed, and much more. And now, on to our interview. All right, Rochelle, thank you so much for joining us in the Black Film Space podcast. How are you doing today? Hi, Reggie. Thanks for having me. I'm doing pretty well. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, we're really excited to to have you on the Black Film Space podcast because this is our first interview where we are getting some historical perspective. And, uh, and it's not an American historical perspective. So I think this would be a really great interview. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to, you know, just, just learning more about uh, Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean cinema back in the 1950s. So what inspired you to take a career as a lecturer in film studies? So I, my, my first degree, uh, my undergraduate degree was done in mass communication. And I had also done courses in literature. And when I graduated from university, I went to work in a TV station and uh, did short video productions as part of my work there as a journalist. Uh, So I became interested in visual language and communicating through film. Um, You know, did a a graduate degree in um, literature and went on to do a PhD all at the University of the West Indies Mona. Um, in literature, and I, I guess you would say film studies, although officially the, the PhD was in literature, but I, I did work on Jamaican film. Um, and then when I joined the staff and the Department of Literatures in English at UWI, and um, prior to that, I had worked in another department at UWI. Um, I I was drawn to film. Uh, There were at that time, you know, maybe one course at the university in film studies. And part of the mandate when I was hired by Literatures in English was to develop a program in film studies because I had had this um, experience in my uh, earlier career and I had um, researched Jamaican film uh, diasporic film as part of my PhD. So that's what really started it. Um, and film studies has really allowed me to pull together all of these different, um, you know, work experiences, academic um, study and research, and just um, a passion and interest I've had for visual communication and film. So you mentioned in your work that early, the earlier expressions of Caribbean cinema in the mid 20th century is not widely known. Why do you think that's the case? Well, if, if I take my own experience, uh, I remember when I had started doing my PhD um, and this would have been in the 90s, 1990s, uh, and and I, I had already embarked on the work of doing research on narrative film in Jamaica. And according to the scholarship at the time, the first Jamaican film to be made was The Harder They Come in 1972. And I was really struck when I attended a talk given by the late Franklin Sanjus, known universally as Chappie, 
uh, where he declared that the harder they come was not the first Jamaican film. And, and I was a little taken aback. Um, and, and he went on to talk about the work of the Jamaica Film Unit, which had been set up uh, in the early 1950s, I think 1951. And he spoke about the work they had done. And, and that was the first time that I had heard about uh, this film unit and had heard that um, Jamaicans were making films prior to the 1970s. So, so it was something of a, a revelation, but perhaps it was something that's not un uncommon in our experience as Caribbean people and as West Indians, that these important stories that tell our history are not always as well known as we would like. So when I heard uh, Chappie talk about the Jamaica Film Unit, it, it drove me and inspired me to find out more. Uh, and I, I began to read um, much later after I had um, you know, done the work of the PhD and so on, I, I started to research it more. And then Terry Francis published a very important article uh, and I'm sorry, I don't have the date of that article to hand. Um, it, it, it may have been uh, post 2000, I believe. Um, and in that article, she gave a chronology of the development of the Jamaica Film Unit. And she spoke about the work of the, the, one of the founders of the Jamaica Film Unit, which was Martin Reynolds. Um, and she told, she, she, you know, documented some of the work they had done. So that was important. Um, that was groundbreaking. I had also discovered the Colonial Film Database, uh, which is an open access database that um, documented the work of uh, film units in Jamaica and uh, around the colonial, the British colonial empire. Uh, so, so all of these bits started coming together, but you know, in, in my work, I've found that it's not it's not a, a film practice. It's not a a, a story that um, you know is widely known. And part of that is that part of the reason for that is that there's still so much more of that history that needs to be documented. Uh, so, so for me, um, I have uh, recently, I, I would say perhaps in the last five years, uh, which, which is relatively recently in, in academic research terms, that I've, I've embarked on this research to further document that history, not only in Jamaica, but throughout the Anglophone Caribbean. Were you able to um, measure like the cultural impact of some of these initial films that were made, uh, especially like right after, um, you know, I guess you could say emancipation or, you know, the uh, Jamaica was no longer co colonized. Right. So, so the, this, this, um, this film practice, it, it emerged in the 1950s. So independence in Jamaica was 1962 and then okay. later, and, and then later in Barbados. And, and it's a difficult, it's a difficult story to document. Um, many of the films made in Jamaica during that period uh, no longer exist. There, there have been problems in terms of storage. Uh, you know, there's some really kind of shocking stories about, you know, how many of these films, there was no storage, storage space and, and they were not preserved. They were allowed to um, be destroyed. Um, some of the documentation of that period also is very difficult to find. Some of the documentation that exists, um, you know, it's not precise. So you might see a reference to a film, but it doesn't give the year of production, or it, it might not give the title of the film. So it's, so it's difficult to trace, uh, you know, the production or, or any single production. Um, and, and some of those records have also not been preserved. You, you can't find some of them in the archives. So, so it's a difficult story to, to piece together. And, and of course, many of the people that were involved in that, um, in, in the production of those films have, have died. 
so so it's difficult to to put it all together in the research that was collected for these like uh-huh. initial films oh, that were impact. made in the caribbean yes. yeah like what was there any you know notes about like the cultural impact you know were they popular right. did people know about them did they speak about any sort of political um or social issues happening at the time because i know that a lot of time film is typically birthed through that you know right. so i was just curious yeah um so so there weren't as far as i can tell like studies to to kind of measure impact um but i have found that as i've started this research and and started talking to people that you know it's 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 really interesting it's so uh, as i started talking to like the older members of my family about it they'll say oh yeah I, i remember those films or i remember going to see those films but we had never spoken about it before. So it's, it's like the questions, you know, evoke these memories and responses and you hear about them. Because they also use, besides showing them, um, you know, in cinemas um, or at schools or community centers, these films were also shown through mobile cinema vans. So, so these vans would go to both uh, urban and remote rural communities set up at night, put up a screen, they'd have speakers and they'd show these films. And some of the pictures um, from those, from that period uh, show like, you know, huge audiences. And, you know, the the documents and reports of these screenings say, you know, like in Barbados, uh, there's very detailed documentation and and thank goodness it has been preserved. And some of those reports will will identify like, you know, 2,000 people, 3,000 people at a single screening. Mm. So so they even note in the reports that there were so many people that, you know, all of them could not possibly have seen the screen. But they still came. Some of the, the pictures show you like these masses of people um, and, and these people were poor, so they're standing up for maybe an hour, two hours, barefoot, um, you know, little boys, older men. The pictures I've seen show mostly men at these shows. So, you know, they, they, they did have an impact. They, they were important to the people at that time. As, as I said, my older siblings um, talk about going to see these shows and, and they remember, like, um, I mean, my brother spoke about the Abbott and Costello shows that they used to film because that, sorry, films that they used to show because they would show the local films as well as imported films. Uh, so, so I think there was a huge uh, social impact and the, the locally made films were um, intended to have a, 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 they had a developmental and educational focus. So there were largely documentaries, docudramas, newsreels, something that they call cinemas, which I imagine must have been like a, a kind of magazine news show. So, so um, you know, one person that I interviewed in Barbados spoke about how these films uh, helped to bring the outside world in. These were the foreign-made films that were that were also shown at these uh, shows. They helped to bring the foreign world in the outside world in but what the the locally made films did was that they uh, had these developmental objectives so for instance they would um you know show farmers uh you know more efficient ways of growing crops or um you know how to care for dairy uh, how to manage a dairy farm um or they would you know give uh, information and tips about child care or self-help projects. Um, there, there was an important film um, made in in Barbados in the 1950s that advised people how to vote and register for the first general election that was conducted under universal adult suffrage. Um, you know, so so they were they were important. They they had a, a social impact but they also had a development and political impact as well. Can you explain to us the significance of the film Better Living and how it intersects with the nation formation that was happening at the time? 
Better Living was the, the second film made by the Barbados Film Unit. And the premiere for that was held in 1953. Now, in, in order to understand, you know, how these films functioned in these societies, we have to remember that um, the period that they were made was the decade prior to independence. Um, so, and, and I, I think it's important to remember too that independence in, in the West Indies, and, and I, as I imagine anywhere else, political independence from the colonial power didn't, didn't happen as a moment. Um, it, it was a gradual process. So, so we see during the, the period of the 1950s, this kind of gradual movement towards independence. Um, and, and that is also marked by successive constitutions and political arrangements during the 1950s that um, provide for increasing degrees of self-rule. So, so for instance, uh, there's another film called A Nation is Born that uh, records and celebrates West Indian Federation, right? And that, that film was made in um, I think that was 1958. Uh, better living. So, so, so we think of that period of the 1950s as the, the the decade prior to the advent of independence um, in the West Indies, the, the beginning of independence in political independence in the West Indies. In many of the films of the period then of the 1950s, we see this concern with building a national consciousness, with building uh, and, and creating ideas about national identity um, and with conveying ideas about your responsibilities as a citizen and defining yourself as um, you know, a, a West Indian, a Barbadian, a Jamaican, um, even though independence, political independence has not yet been achieved. So, so that term better living um, harks back to a, a term used by the colonial powers, right? And, and we see it used in particular reference to um, using films for development as well. But it's this idea of creating um, conditions for better living among the, or among the colonial subjects. Um, and, and what happens in Better Living is that this, this is a film about self-help and it's intended to encourage self-help and to build ideas about self-help and to convey why self-help is important. In, in other words, they're saying to people, you're, you cannot rely on the authorities, however you define them, to do something for you. You, you have to help yourself. This is your um, responsibility as a citizen. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, there, yes, we accept that that, that, that is true. Um, but also, I, I think that what's going on there is that it is, in, in some ways, relieving the authorities of the full responsibility. So, so in uh, Better Living, um, what happens is that the, the home, the domestic space is, is seen as this kind of crucible, as uh, this site where ideas about nation, citizenship, self-help and so on are formulated and created and encouraged and nurtured and nourished and so on. And the female, the, the mother, the wife is at the center of this. Um, so the, the film uses uh, a structure, the, a Mr. Wise and Mr. Foolish structure, um, you know, where we have one set of characters who are wise and do what they should do and therefore uh, achieve certain objectives and success, and another set of characters who are foolish, who uh, do not do what they need to do, and of course their lives end in misery. Um, and that kind of narrative structure is, is something that the filmmakers in um, the West Indian Film Unit would have been taught at the training school that the British authorities uh, organized to teach West Indians how to make films. So, 
So in uh, Better Living, they use this structure. And of course, Mrs. Wise does all the right things. Uh, you know, she, she, she trains her children and, and they use this word train. She trains her children. She is an efficient housewife. Um, she encourages her children to help around the home. She budgets the money that her husband gives her. Uh, she uh, is, is obligingly subordinate to him, you know. He's, he's not seen in the film very much, but he's the head of the household. Um, but whereas Mrs. Foolish does everything wrong, you know, she can't cook, she wastes food, the meals are pleasant, the house is untidy, the baby lies on the floor, all of these things that create a miserable marriage and a miserable husband who then does not help in the home. Uh, so, so the films really define the, the wife and mother as subordinate to the man but really as the important figures in the home who help to create these values that are so necessary, the film suggests, for nation building, right? The idea that um, Mrs. Mrs. Wise helps herself. Both families, uh, the income of both families is, is 10 pounds per week or $10 per week, but, um, the, the wise family is able to do so much more and achieve so much more um, because they have these desired values. Uh, the foolish family, um, you know, ends up in misery. Um, Mr. Foolish is arrested or taken to debtor's jail or something like that um, because they do not have um, these, these values of pride, industry, self-help are not part of their family structure. So, so the idea, I mean, so what the, the film conveys very strongly is how the home, the values in the home become so important um, in, in this idea of development, um, pride, um, and the building of the nation. So the films that were developed in the Caribbean in the mid 20th century around this time, you know, did they serve as a device to unite various, you know, countries throughout the Caribbean? And if so, how? Yeah, uh, this, this is one of the reasons, you know, why I, I'm so concerned that we should know this aspect of our history in, in the Caribbean, because in fact, um, Film functioned in a very important way in, in mid 20th century to unite the colonies in the region, the British colonies in the region, and, and to connect them with places beyond. Um, so, so because there was the uh, colonial film unit headquartered in London um, that had this really impressive network, I would say, um, of film production, distribution and exhibition that connected, I guess, all of the, that connected the entire British empire, the colonial film unit made films and exported them to different points of the empire. Um, it, so there was this, this really fantastic network uh, when the, uh, of, of which the West Indian film units were a part, sorry. So there was a fantastic, um, distribution, production and distribution network that was organized by the co colonial film unit. And the West Indian colonies were part of that network. When the West Indian film units were established uh, in beginning in, the in 1951, and they started to make their own films, their films then became incorporated into that network. So West Indian films, uh, Better Living, um, would have become part of that distributed network and would have been sent to different parts of the British colonial empire. But they also, um, the, the units also functioned as distribution points of their own. So in the records of the units, we see where they are sending their films to each other. So at that 1953 premiere of Better Living, um, the news reports say that a Jamaican film, You Can Help Your Child, 
was also shown at that premiere. And we have reports that that tell us that um, you know better living was sent to Trinidad. Um, it was sent to I think Dominican Republic. Um, it was sent to British Guyana. So so each unit also distributed films to other points in the Caribbean, to other uh, West Indian colonies. And there was also um, exchange between the unit in terms of assistance. Uh, so for instance, there was a, a film, Three Royal Days, about the, the visit of a, a British royal to the Caribbean. And the Jamaican, Trinidad, and British Guyana film units collaborated to make that. Um, there was another film, uh, British Guyana, 1957, um, in which was uh, and, uh, the British Guyana Film Unit received assistance from the film officer from the Trinidad and Tobago Film Unit to, to make that film. When the Barbados Film Unit made A Nation is Born in 1958 about the, about the West Indies Federation, it traveled to Trinidad to make that film. So, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm only really referring to instances that, that I have come across where this collaboration is documented, but, and I'm sure that it has not all been documented or that I have not been able to, um, you know, identify mm -hmm. all of these instances. Um, so so it, it's an important part of the story, I think, because, at that time, how the films were developed or, or created was that uh, prints were sent to um, the Colonial Film Unit in London for processing and for dubbing of sound. Uh, so so it, it, it says to us that for much of the 1950s, the West Indian Film Units did not have the technology to uh, fully create the film, right? The, the post-production had to be done elsewhere. So, so it, it creates a sense of a kind of technological deficit. But what I'm also discovering as, as I've just um, stated is that there was this collaboration where assistance and skill in using the technology was shared among the different colonies. So there, there was this sense and this aspect to to the development of this film culture that we helped ourselves. So you mentioned in your work that the Jamaican film unit had a mandate, which was to produce films for Jamaicans, by Jamaicans, with Jamaicans yeah. designed to assist in the solution of Jamaica's problem, educational, social, cultural, and economical. Can you right. elaborate more on the creation of the Jamaican film unit and the other film units from some of these other um, West Indian countries, did they have similar mandates? Yeah, the, so we know a lot about the Jamaican film, the Jamaican film unit um, because the, one of the, the founders, the first director of that unit, Martin Ret Reynolds, was very prolific in terms of writing that story. Um, he wrote an unpublished memoir, which is held at the National Library of Jamaica. And he also wrote a master's thesis. He was at, um, I think it's University of Boston. Um, he did a, a master's degree and he submitted a thesis on the development of film in Jamaica for, for that degree. And, um, you know, we have access to those two uh, documents uh, that help us to know quite a lot about the Jamaican film unit. So, so, so records like that, I've not been able to uncover those kinds of complete records or documentations of other film units. And I, I would add here that, you know, this is ongoing research for me. Mm -hmm. My plan was to get to 
uh, Trinidad and Tobago to try to do some archival research this summer and to return to Guyana to do uh, further archival research about the British Guyana Film Unit. But um, travel plans for the summer, you know, have been thrown into disarray. Uh, so this is ongoing research for me as well. Um, but the, the film units in, in the region um, really came about through the establishment of a film training school in 1950 at what was then the University College of the West Indies at Mona, Jamaica. And how, it, how, how that uh, school was um, established and created was that um, in the 1940s, the, the common thinking about the colonies and about development in the colonies, and, and prior to that, the 1930s as well, the common thinking was that film was too expensive, um, too difficult to produce to use as a developmental tool in the West Indian colony. Um, what, what was recommended was, um, you know, visual aids and something they called film strips, which, which was static pictures on a, on a strip of film. Uh, it was felt that film was too, um, too expensive, um, that we did not have the technology, that the conditions were not favorable to use film. We, we then saw a, a shift in that thinking um, in the late 1940s, where their, their, this, the colonial authorities started to discuss the need for the colonies to make their own film. And, and part of this partly aligned with the move towards decolonization. You know, the idea that uh, the colonies should more and more uh, govern themselves. Uh, however that was conceived, uh, might not be full independent, but that they should take on a, a more active role uh, in, in terms of government. But also, I, I think that we can also I, identify um, a, an economic argument in there, that, that it was becoming very expensive for the colonial film unit in Britain to continue funding, you know, what I've earlier described as this fantastic production and distribution system. It, it was expensive. So, so they started to move or, or they talked about moving production um, to the colonies, decentralizing production. This eventually resulted in the setting up of uh, the West Indian Film Training School in Jamaica in 1950. And the Colonial Film Unit, they, they, they got a grant um, and they funded that school and those colonies who could afford to pay for the expenses of their participants and who had, um, you know, participants, suitable persons that they could send for training were invited to do so. Uh, so there were six men, all men, who came from three from Jamaica, one from Barbados, one from British Guyana, and one from Trinidad and Tobago, came to Mona to do that to do to attend that school and um, I, I, we it's referred to as a school but it was really a, a nine to twelve months I think it is it's uncertain how long it actually lasted for a, a training program and then each of those men went returned to their their colonies in the case of Barbados and British Guyana um, and in the case of Jamaica well they, they just you know, move further down the road uh, to the ministry, sorry, to the Department of Education. And they set up film units in their respective colonies. So, so each of the film units set up in the British West Indies um, was a direct result of that training program. In Jamaica, uh, those three men were the founding uh, employees or, me or members of the Jamaica Film Unit. And as I said, that film unit was set up as a unit within the Department of Education because it was seen as and understood as having this mandate, as, as you've said, to, um, to make films for Jamaicans, by Jamaicans, with Jamaicans, um, and, and this mandate to 
promote the development of Jamaica and to address uh, social and economic issues in Jamaica. So that's how that's how they all started uh, from this uh, common course and then this movement outwards from Mona to start these units in the various um, in the various colonies. You know, in America, I guess, or in Western society in particular, uh, the uh, I guess you could say the promotion. I don't want to say the invention, but the promotion of celebrity is key with film and you know getting the word out about film were there any like key figures that you know maybe had that same kind of uh their power um throughout the caribbean at the time film was being developed over there no i i wouldn't say so for for these um locally made films uh you know some of them were quite short um you know 10 minutes 20 minutes 30 minutes uh, they were largely documentary. Um, they were informational. They were didactic. Uh, some of them do use narrative techniques, and, and I think we can identify some of them as narrative films as well. But I, I wouldn't say there was much of a, a kind of cult of personality, not, not that I can make out. And of course, the other factor there was that um, many of the units certainly at the beginning, did not have the technology to do synchro sound. So sound typically, sound was dubbed when the, when the films were sent to the Colonial Film Unit in London for, for processing. Uh, so some of them were a little awkward because it, they could not, um, you know, they couldn't do dialogue. You, you would hear sound, you would hear a narrator but you would not hear dialogue. So I, I don't know, it might, might have been difficult. Right. But, but, but that's an interesting question that you asked nevertheless, because um, when, when I look at, um, you know, there, there's a film, many of, the, many of the colonies made independence films. So, so film became, again, this, this kind of important um, mode for recording independence, for celebrating independence, um, you know, and, and informing the new citizens about uh, or, or encouraging them to conceive of the new nation in, in specific ways. And when we look at the film that was made at Independence in Jamaica, and it, it's also called A Nation is Born, which is the same title used, a, a very ironic, the same title used for the film commemorating the West Indies Federation. Um, so when we look at A Nation is Born, the 1962 independence film made in Jamaica, it, it records all the activities of the inaugural Independence Day. And, and what is hugely ironic about this film is that uh, I, I would say that the most prominent single figure in the film is Princess Margaret. So, so Princess Margaret was the representative of uh, the royal family and the British government. She was the official representative and she attended the inaugural, cele uh, the inaugural independence uh, celebration and activities. So she attended, you know, the, the parliamentary ritual that, um, signified the passing of power from the colonial power to Jamaica. Uh, so so it, to me, it's, it's really ironic that it's not the, the prime minister, the, the first prime minister of Jamaica, um, so Alexander Bustamante, who is most prominent in this film. It is, you know, the representative of the British crown, Princess Margaret. And, and indeed there are scenes in that film that show Princess Margaret's arrival from London, uh, that show her driving through the streets and, and this kind of adoring crowd, you know, running after her car and a, a song is playing, you know, saying how glad we are to have you visit. So, uh, you, you know, she comes closest to this idea of celebrity. Even as I say that, I, I mean, we, you know, it, it 
I, I have to also add that there, there may well have been very kind of practical reasons for that, right? That, you know, it, it, she was a celebrity uh, at the time, right? Um, and, and she did represent, uh, dare I say, it, a, a kind of exoticism for local Jamaicans, you know, this, this woman coming from abroad as, uh, as a representative of the British crown. It's, for us, an uh, exotic figure. But, but also, prior to independence, there was the arrangement of federation. And uh, for, for your American listeners who may not know, but federation was this amalgamation of a political collective of all the West Indian or most of the West Indian territories, including Barbados, um, Jamaica, Trinidad, um, and, and others. And how federation, the story of how federation broke up, how that collective broke up was that the uh, then uh, leader of the opposition in Jamaica, Sir Alexander Bustamante, came out against federation in Jamaica. That consequently led to a referendum where Jamaicans voted to leave the, the West Indies Federation and then a, a general election in which uh, Bustamante was, um, which Bustamante and his political party, the Jamaica Labour Party, won. Uh, and so Bustamante became the first um, prime minister of Jamaica. So, so even as I think of the filmmakers making that film, A Nation is Born, and um, you know, using the figure of Princess Margaret rather than the first prime minister of Jamaica as, as a kind of unifying mm -hmm. figure in the film, it, you know, that, 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 that decision to leave Federation, it, it, it was a, a, a um, divisive kind of, of issue. Uh, and in, in fact, the decision to become independent was also not um, universally su supported. And to identify the leader uh, uh, of the nation, uh, the prime minister, Bustamante, uh, the leader of, of the GLP at the time, as a, a figure to represent the interests of the entire collective might have been problematic. It would have been political tri politically tricky. So, so I can well see why greater attention, greater, um, uh, you know, that Princess Margaret occupies more space in the narrative rather than um, Bustamante. Can you give us a primer on the tr transition from, you know, Caribbean cinema in the 1950s and, and how a lot of those films were, you know, documentary or um, kind of like these self-help self -help videos to the current state of West Indian cinema? What what happened with those 19, those early 1950s films is that or, or I should say that what happened with the uh, film unit was that they, they gradually changed and moved towards production for television. Because with the advent of television in the 1960s in the region, um, you know, that, that idea of, or, or that activity of showing the films through the cinema vans to rural communities and so on, that began to decline. The, the numbers attending those shows began to decline as television became available. Uh, and what, ha what happened was that the film units also, over time, shifted to production for television and shifted in time to video production. And what we've also documented, what I've also documented is that in Jamaica, what happened as well, uh, I haven't been able to explore this in the other um, colonies, but what happened in Jamaica is that there also was a shift from, not a, not a complete shift, but, but certainly a kind of um, lack of focus um, from mm. developmental production, productions which sought to give mm. information about uh, you know, agriculture, cultural practices, and so on, 
and this became the production unit became involved in in what we might call uh, propaganda very very loosely but or public relations right what what they started to do was to promote um, the activities of the government, the activities of uh, government ministers and so on, and began to operate like um, government information services, uh, as they do, they tend to do in the Caribbean, that um, give exposure and promote what the government does, what, what an administration does. So, so that's what happened with um, certainly Jamaica and um, Barbados as well. And in the other uh, territories as well, television meant, you know, the kind of uh, downgrading and reduced production for these film units and this shift in focus. So, so there is a, a, a kind of a direct link between the production and then the emergence of narrative film in the English-speaking Caribbean in the 1970s. I, I don't see it as a, a direct chain or path. I, I think of it as two different waves of production. The colonial, the, the, the wave of production that started during the colonial period, and then another wave of production that started um, in the post-colonial period after independence. There, there are some linkages, uh, for instance, we can think of how the um, the period of production and the, in the colonial period and the film unit created this reservoir of knowledge um, and of talent. So, for instance, a, a name that I, I called earlier, Franklin St. Juice, worked with the Jamaica Film Unit in uh, the 1960s, and he, up until his his death. Um, he continued to work um, in film production in Jamaica and is associated with films like <laughs> The Harder They Come. And he was director of photography for that film, as well as uh, wow. Children of Babylon, which was made locally in 1980. Um, so, so there is that idea of, of how these the early film units um, work to develop skills in filmmaking and, and in various aspects of filmmaking. Um, I, I, I see another line of continuation in terms of the focus on ideas about nation. The films produced by the film units were um, very concerned with nationalism, with uh, creating ideas about a national identity, how, how we define ourselves as West Indian. And, and I think that this concern can also be traced in the film, that second wave of films that emerge in the post-colonial period. Um, in terms of form or, or in terms of that move from documentary to narrative film, um, the film unit films were funded by the state. And they were, in, in terms of the ideology that they expressed, very conservative. In the films coming in the post-independence period, what we see is a questioning of some of those uh, assumptions that are taken for granted in the film unit uh, production. So uh, uh, the uh, maxim that you spoke to that was the kind of operating theme for the Jamaica Film Unit. We're making films for Jamaicans, by Jamaicans, um, to address social economic problems in Jamaica. It, it asserts a, a, a homogenous idea of Jamaica, of national identity. It, it assumes that or, or it suggests that uh, we're all Jamaicans and we're all defined homogeneously. We're all the same. I, I find that what happens in the post-independence films is that those kinds of assumptions are questioned. And what we see emerging in the films, in the narrative films, 
our stories that prompt us to think about how are we defined as Jamaicans and that prompt us to recognize that, um, you know, we're not all equal, that there are social and economic imbalances, um, that there are hierarchies that remain that divide us politically, culturally, economically, and that this idea of of nation um, is, is of a collective that um, expresses all of these various conflicts. Um, so, so that for me is a, a concern. It is a, a continuing concern that I think we can trace from the 1950s, but when it re-emerges in the post-independence film, there is such a, a radically different kind of perspective about these questions and issues. The, the, other, the other point that I would make in this regard is that um, the state supported the film unit, but in the post-colonial era, filmmakers have had to um, you know, seek funding, um, and they've had to do the work to draw audiences to their film. So, so it's a commercial cinema. It's, it's a cinema, uh, what emerged uh, in the post-colonial period is, is a cinema that is um, seeking an audience and that the filmmaker has had to do the work to get investment or to seek funding for his film. So, you know, documentaries are not going to draw as large an audience as the narrative film. So, so that's the path that the later filmmakers have decided to take. Now we do see some documentaries, um, you know, e emerging as well, but certainly uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s, um, you know, the, the full length narrative uh, was the way that the, the filmmakers decided to go. If um, someone in 2020 wanted to get connected to this, you know, Caribbean filmmaking community, um, how would you recommend they do that? Yeah, in, in 2020, I, I would say that we, in the Caribbean, the English-speaking Caribbean, um, there's an active filmmaking community. I, I can't really speak very, uh, in much depth for um, some of the other islands. Um, certainly in Jamaica, uh, we have an active community here. And I, I guess that the, the most obvious point of entry for anybody trying to make contact with local filmmakers is JAFTA, which is the Jamaica Association of Film and Television Producers. And they have a, a really um, you know, active membership um, you know, one of the things they do is a script to screen competition called Propeller. And that's a competition where they advertise for entries, you submit, I think you submit a treatment, and then they will fund, they're assisted by Chase funding this and JAMPRO, which is a, a government agency. Uh, and they will fund the production of your short film. And these films, they've, they've been, that um, competition has been running, I think maybe four years now. The films are hugely popular. Um, they give, uh, you know, a, a local filmmakers who are starved for funding, they give them the opportunity to, to do a short film. Um, and all other kinds of opportunities to show their films at film festivals, uh, to do development labs on, on writing and, and all other aspects of filmmaking. Um, so, so that's really been very successful and it, it has been successful in terms of raising interest and awareness about what's going on in Jamaica within filmmaking circles. And, and as I've said, uh, it's been very successful in terms of developing talent and developing ideas. Uh, so, so that to me stands out as um, you know, something really exciting and dynamic that's, that's going on locally. Um, and how can folks get in touch with you? If, if anybody wanted to contact me, uh, they could email me. Uh, it's, a, it's a long email address. So it's rachel.mosleywood 
at uwimona.edu.jm. But I'm located at University of the West Indies, Mona, in Jamaica, and I'm in the Department of Literatures and English. And how do you spell uh, your first name? It's R-A-C-H-E-L, and then dot M-O-S-E-L-E-Y-W-O-O-D at U-W-I-Mona dot E-D-U dot J-M. Thank you so much, Rochelle. This was incredibly informative. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no, this is really, really important information. You know, a lot of us know film from a contemporary standpoint, um, but we need to know who the trailblazers are and, you know, commemorate them, so. You know, I, I'm really quite passionate about this period of production. Um, there's so much work and further research that needs to be done mm -hmm. um, to, you know, complete writing this story. Um, I despair that I'll, I'll ever be able to, to get it done. You know, I'm, I'm not a trained historian. This is, this is historical investigation. And as a, a colleague at the university said to me, you know, when you're doing this kind of archival research, uh, sometimes, you know, you're, you're in the archive for weeks and that might result in maybe one sentence. So, so you have the one sentence on the page and nobody might know that it took you two weeks to get that information. So it's, it's painstaking, um, you know, and it's demanding both mentally and physically, because you're, you know, you're hunched over, uh, you know, a viewfinder or some old book or something. But um, when you find a little gem of information, it's really very rewarding. So, so I, I work hoping and, and looking forward to, to finding that little gem. We appreciate all the, the hard work that you're putting into it. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Black Film Space podcast. If you're interested in being part of our community and attending events, please visit us at blackfilmspace.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Black Film Space. Subscribe to our email list and podcast. All right, see you soon.